Uh, well, I really appreciate the invitation too. And um, you know what I mean when I say um, uh, imposter syndrome? You've come across that concept? I have that all the time. So I've just learned to live with it, but I'm always, and everybody at MTF Labs has the same experience. You know why everybody else is in the room, but you're not quite sure how you got to be there. Um, but um, I'm actually going to read from a script to start with, only from the beginning. Um, it's not something I typically do. I normally just talk, particularly in a small group like this, but there's a bunch of stuff that I really wanted to say. And I wanted to make sure I didn't miss any of it. Uh, and so I hope you'll forgive me that I'm, I'm actually just going to read off the page for a little bit. But that is not going to be your experience for this whole day. Um, so I don't know what your expectations are for this. Uh, and so this was really very difficult to prepare for. I don't know where you're at. Um, and I don't know where you would like to be at. I don't know what you currently do. I don't know, uh, for instance, the use of the word metaverse in the title really threw me because it's something that almost everybody has stopped talking about. Um, so we will talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about the discourse of this, but just, I, I'm gonna tell you about me so that you know and so that I can be reassured why I am here. Um, and I'm going to tell you more about me than you could possibly ever want to know. Uh, I'm going to ask you to indulge me on that for a couple of reasons. First, so that you have a clear sense of why it's me at the front of this room uh, and to offer, uh, and what I have to offer in terms of understanding emerging technologies uh, in this business, whatever the boundaries of this business might be. Um, and also to understand why I'm not going to do all the talking today. Uh, and a lot of that is going to be on you. Um, I hope you're going to learn a lot today, but my expectation is that I will learn more from you than you will learn from me. I always try to be the stupidest person in the room, and I'm very often successful. Um, so uh, let's start here. My name, as Hugo said, is Andrew Dubber. Uh, most people, including my wife, call me Dubber. Um, Andrew is also fine. It is not important. Over to you. Um, I live in Sweden. I believe this is my fifth or sixth time here in Aveiro. Um, the first thing you need to know about me is that I am very old. Uh, I am 55. I am right smack in the middle of what is commonly referred to as Gen X. Um, and that means a few things. First, it's that this bit where I talk about my background will probably take a while. Um, there's a lot of it. And you probably know if an old person ever has the opportunity to bang on about the old days, you better get comfortable. Uh, the second thing, it means that I've got a lot of experience in dealing with the emergence of new technologies. Um, I can not only remember the emergence of social media, uh, the rise of Napster, and the internet, and the personal computer. I can remember building the first PC I owned in 1992. I can remember the emergence of the CD, which is the first consumer digital music technology uh, that I can think of in the mid to late 80s. I can remember the shift in the recording studio from analog tape to digital recording. I can remember how the fax machine changed the workplace. Uh, I can remember the first Space Invaders machines and Pong before that. I remember the advent of color television. Um, and uh, I can remember a world before Star Wars. Um, so, my first paid job in the music industry was duplicating cassettes. So, um, you're going to have to work pretty hard to surprise me with technological change. Um, the scale of change from a world of cameras that had rolls of film in them and nobody owned calculators, let alone computers, to a world where everyone has a supercomputer in their pocket with 5G broadband and an Instagram account, it's, it's you know, there's a, a new tech is going to have to work pretty hard to you know, surprise me or make me worry about the future. Um, most people think that old people are scared of change. You think this is change? This is just hypercapitalism, hypercapitalizing, right? Okay, so we have seen a lot more change than is going on at the moment. It is accelerating, and we'll talk about that, but this is not a new phenomenon, okay? Just so you know where you're at. Um, I've also spent most of every day of the past 40 or so years thinking about the relationship between music and technology in some way or the other. Those are two things that I'm really interested in, but I'm particularly interested in where they intersect and, and have been for a long time. Uh, third and most importantly, being old also means you should not listen to what I have to say. 
um, I am out of touch. I am not immersed in the day-to-day -day experience that you're immersed in. Um, I am not in the cutting edge of anything other than my professionally sharpened knives, hence this. Um, and uh, as Howard DeVoto sang, I am angry, I am ill, and I'm as ugly as sin. My irritability keeps me alive and kicking. If you get that reference, there is some degree of overlap in our, um, our cultural experiences, but as I say, that, that is a very old reference, and I'm a very old person. Okay. Um, I am not especially excited about new technologies for their newness. I live in an 18th century farmhouse in a forest in an old fishing village in the north of Sweden, where the entire winter population is about 70 people and about a thousand reindeer. Um, I have my dogs, I have my records, I have two meters of snow outside my door, and I like to cook. Increasingly, I like to cook with fire. Um, because I'm old, I like a lot of old things. Um, but one thing that I really like that is new is music. Uh, I listen to and I DJ a lot of different music for a really broad time span, but more than half, I would say, of what I listen to at any given time was probably released within the last three months. Um, I make it a real point to always listen to new music. Um, approximately half of that is what you might generally term electronic music, um, and about half of that, again, is what could arguably come under the banner of experimental electronic music. Um, however, just to be clear and to, again, underline the fact that I am very old, um, the vast majority of all of that is what you might also call quiet music. So, um, Douglas Adams, uh, the author of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which you might be familiar with, once said that anything that was invented before you were born is just part of the natural world and not surprising or interesting in any way. Anything that was invented between your birth and the age of 30 years old is potentially new and cool and interesting and something that you might want to get a job in at some point. And anything invented after you turn 30 is unnatural, unusable, and possibly demonic. Um, so I just want to frame your expectations here. Um, so I'm old, or at least I am older than you. Uh, maybe you should also know that I am from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, I lived for 10 years in Britain, but I think of myself as a Kiwi who lives in Sweden. So that manifests itself in a number of different ways. Uh, one of them is that I love dub and reggae. Um, I think women should be in charge of pretty much everything. Uh, I've had to specifically work on not talking so fast, which is a real Kiwi trait. And I will support any team playing any sport if they are playing against Australia. Uh, it also means that I come from somewhere that isn't a major part of the international conversation around music uh, in the way that the US, the UK, and also Sweden are. Uh, those three, incidentally, are the only net exporters of music on the planet. And Sweden, per head of population, uh, per you know, head of capita, is um, is uh, doing better than the other two. Um, but it makes me aware of uh, a bunch of things. Um, I know from experience that nobody here started a career in the music sector because they thought it was a great get-rich-quick scheme. Um, this is not why we do this, right? Um, uh, it also makes me an immigrant, it makes me aware of indigenous populations and cultures that aren't mine, aware of the influence of migration on things like technology and music, and it makes me interested in culture, which is something we're probably going to talk a lot about. Um, professionally, I got into radio thinking that it was a good way to get into the music industry. I always wanted to be a record producer. Um, and that was my ambition. So I thought that if I got into radio, I would learn the ropes, I would learn the studio, I would learn sound engineering and become a record producer. That is not a good way to become a record producer. Um, uh, but I found that I loved radio and I, I had always had a thing for radio. Um, but so my background is I was a sound engineer, uh, I became a producer of radio, uh, writer and broadcaster in that order. Um, I made some award-winning uh, award radio documentaries and radio dramas, kids shows, and then music programs, including some jazz programs. And through that, I got to record a lot of jazz musicians, and through that, I fell into becoming a, a record producer. Um, for a while, I was also a driver for touring bands, um, so whenever Massive Attack, Rolling Stones, U2, Janet Jackson came to town, I would drive them around, and, and I, another thing I was not particularly good at. That was interesting, though possibly not relevant to this. But with a, a musician called Mark De Clive Lowe, I started a record label uh, in uh, Auckland. It was a jazz label, 
uh, that we ran out of our shared apartment. Um, again, not the greatest get-rich-quick scheme in the world, but it was the first record label in the Southern Hemisphere with a website, to our knowledge. Um, we were selling music online. This was 1997, 1998. Um, and as far as I'm aware, and I've not found a counterexample to this, we were the first people doing that below the equator. Okay. Um, uh, we also launched something called jazz.co.nz, which was an online community for the New Zealand jazz sector, um, which is not enormous. Um, but it was at a point in time where you could go to a bookstore and buy a paperback book that was a directory of all of the websites in the world and what was on them. Um, so this was, you know, fairly early on. Um, and I became also known at the time as the jazz guy on New Zealand radio because I, I, there were only a few people doing it and I was one of them, but it wasn't just because I was playing jazz. I was playing jazz on a dance music radio station. So I was the Sunday afternoon jazz guy on a station that was mostly house, drum and bass, you know, electronic dance music. So this was kind of late 90s, early 2000s, uh, so it was a lot of Jazz and Over, Compost Records, IG Culture, Broken Beat, uh, Phil Asher, Jazz in the House, New Spirit, Helsinki, Four Hero, that kind of terrain, plus Miles Davis, John Coltrane, you know, the usual suspects, but all sort of mixed them together. Um, I got into doing uh, remixes for a while, um, but Remixes as sound art is probably the best way to describe it. Nobody danced to anything that I made. Um, they were, it was, had more to do with the experimental radio production than it had to do with, um, with you know, electronic music production. But um, I then moved to Britain. Actually, no, I skipped a step. I became an academic. Um, running an independent radio production company and an independent record label uh, was financially catastrophic, um, particularly the way I was doing it and where I was doing it and the time I was doing it, etc., etc. You know, we were putting out full price CDs at a time when, you know, a Miles Davis CD was a quarter of the price of what we could put out. And I would tell anybody, buy that one rather than ours, because you need that one more than you need ours. Um, and so it was a really, you know, kind of weird time. Um, so I got into teaching at, uh, at the local university and uh, and I got interested in the research side of things quite a lot. Um, and so my, because I was working in a radio department within a media production, uh, me, yeah, media production, I guess you would call it, a communication studies department, um, a lot of my research was around new technologies and radio. And I also set up a music industry degree there for the first time. Um, I, long story short, but the, the easiest way to explain this, I got headhunted to work on a research project in Britain um, and, uh, and went for a year and stayed for 10, um, but ended up becoming professor of music industry innovation. Um, so I did carry on with the radio stuff uh, and I ended up writing, in fact, my only academic book is, uh, is, a, is called Radio in the Digital Age. But most of my focus was on music industries. Um, uh, and as far as I know, and I'm going to claim this, I was the first professor of music industry innovation. Um, so, which was kind of, a, you know, it's a cool title. We made it up. Um, and part of the reason we made it up is that uh, British university funding uh, for certain things was higher than for certain other things. And if you include the word innovation, you got more money than if you didn't. That's, you know, that's... That's how that worked. Um, and as part of that, I also started a blog. Uh, this was around 2004, nearly 20 years ago, called New Music Strategies. And basically it was, there's this thing called the internet. Everybody's tearing their hair out about it. You know, we had Napster five years ago. Media hasn't been invented yet. What are we going to do? Um, because there is this, there's this five-year chasm between Napster and social media, but basically the whole thing is in free fall. Um, and so I started this thing called New Music Strategies. It's like, it's not what is the internet going to do to us, but how can we use it? You know, 
I mean, it's not going anywhere, right? Things don't get uninvented. Um, and so, uh, so we're going to have to sort of make use of this. And, and the whole point of New Music Strategies was because I was working with independent musicians and independent record labels, and I was far more interested in them than, you know, sort of lawyers and accountants running major record labels. Um, th that was my focus. So I ended up through that sort of doing a lot of consulting for some British record labels, um, Leaf Recordings, uh, Giles Peterson's Brownwood, uh, Brownswood, I should say, uh, Edition Records, which is a jazz label there, a few others, um, but also a lot of independent musicians um, that I would talk with. And mostly because, I mean, th these are people who don't hire consultants, right? Um, but I had a job at the university, and the university thought it was a good thing for me to go out and say, hello, I'm the man from the university. I've been researching some stuff that might be useful to you. Let's have a conversation. And that's this sort of what they called at the time knowledge transfer. Um, and uh, so I was a knowledge transfer fellow as well as then professor of music industry innovation. Um, but as part of writing this New Music Strategies blog and working with these um, record labels and finding out a whole lot of stuff, because like I say, I, I tend to try and learn more than I you know, give um, when I'm, I'm in any context. Um, but I ended up writing a series of blog posts that became a free ebook, uh, and we're now in 2007, and it was called The 20 Things You Must Know About Music Online. And the idea was this is this thing that I, I managed to distill these points. Originally it was like 26, 27 points, but I was, you know, 20 is better for a book title. So uh, I condensed them into essentially 20 short chapters and gave it away as a free PDF online. And it was... It was an interesting phenomenon because there was a lot of talk at the time about, you know, what is the value of something if it's suddenly free? This is, you know, the conversation about music at the time, particularly recordings of music. Because don't get those things mixed up. Recordings of music and music are not the same thing. Um, but this idea that recordings of music were effectively to anybody who wanted them to be free, where is the value? How do we make money? How do we, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and for a long time, that was an unresolved issue. But I was also making something, putting out into the world deliberately as free to flip. Let's see what happens with this. So that got downloaded just over half a million times. Um, and for a couple of reasons. One was that, um, you guys heard of CD Baby? Uh, okay, um, a few. So CD Baby was uh, originally basically a, a e-commerce platform for people to sell their CDs online. Uh, it was just to make it easier for people um, who didn't want to set up their own online web shop. And, uh, and Derek Sivers, who set it up and ran it, who was this, um, again, independent musician who liked to program. And he'd set up you know, CD Baby as a website that allowed him and his friends to sell their records online, and it sort of blew up. He came across, somebody sent it to him, and he decided he was going to share it with every single person who was a you know, signed up member of CD Baby, because he thought there was some useful stuff in there, which, is, you know, which was cool. But then, of course, it got sent to every other blog that had started up about independent music, going, Look, here's this free PDF, here you go. And of course, it, you know, it did the rounds. Um, through that, uh, it got sent to a guy called Ethan Diamond, um, who had been um, one of the two founders of a thing called Odd Post, which none of you have heard of Odd Post, uh, but you have heard of what it became, which is webmail, Yahoo Mail. Uh, Yahoo bought it essentially and, uh, and, and became that. And because they'd invented this thing called webmail um, and sold it to Yahoo and done fairly well out of it, um, but didn't like working for Yahoo, they decided to make something else. And so it was the two guys who started uh, Odd Post, and one of the three guys, I believe, who started Photoshop. Um, they were working on a thing that was about music, uh, and they called it Bandcamp. Um, and Ethan, who was CEO of Bandcamp, at the time got in touch with me and said, we're about to launch this thing. Somebody sent me your book. Basically, we're building what you're describing. Um, and uh, do you want to be on our board of advisors? And so since... 2008, uh, I was on a board of advisors, whatever that means, uh, for Bandcamp, um, and uh, have been since the beginning. So um, that was kind of an interesting thing. But um, because I was the 
Professor of Music Industry Innovation at, uh, at Birmingham City University, which is where I was. Um, I ended up having a lot of conversations that became very, very boring uh, about um, how can I stop people listening to my music, um, which, is, which is ultimately the distillation of those questions about you know, free MP3s and, and those sorts of things. Um, how can we use technology to conduct surveillance on the people who listen to my music? Which again is you know that whole thing about DRM and you know all those sorts of things. They're very much about I want to reach in and break somebody's computer to prevent them from copying my uh, thing, and I want to see how they use my music and how often they play my music and all the rest of it. all the stuff now that actually is completely countable through streaming services was the thing that a lot of people in the music industry wanted to do with the technology. Uh, that was, you know, when you step back in it and go, okay, I, I want to break people's computers, I want to do surveillance, I want to do, you know, <laughs> all of these things. Um, but also, I got, uh, how can I be famous on the internet? And uh, there isn't a recipe for that, right? Um, there, there was never a recipe for that. Uh, and, you know, this, this whole thing about how can we... You know, how can we make money, or how can I be famous, or how can I promote, or how can I... And, and the whole thing became about marketing, which, you know, is important, absolutely important within the music industry, but not something I'm super, super into. Um, but what I did get into was about um, social innovation, about how people were starting to use music in ways that also use technology, but were innovative not in terms of I've made a new app or I've got a you know, website for unsigned bands, which is the one that I kept hearing again and again and again. Um, but it was about innovative ways to use music to help people. You know? So I ended up working on some really fascinating projects in India and Colombia and Venezuela and uh, Brazil um, that were you know, it's about working with um, kids in barrios or, you know, street kids in India or um, uh, independent music collectives in Brazil that had completely organized their own economy outside of the, what they called uh, Foro do Eixo, um, you know, outside of the Axis. Um, and there was some really, I mean, it wasn't me doing these projects, but because I was the researcher, I got to work with those projects and see what they did and, you know, explain them to people and, you know, so I made a documentary about uh, uh, Foro do Asia and I um, made a project with the uh, kids in India where we recorded an album, like we brought a record producer over from uh, Britain, recorded an album of the kids singing and then sold the album on, on Bandcamp to raise money for the charity that was, you know, doing these projects. I really like stuff like that. I think that's a really interesting use, not just of the technology, but of, of innovation of, of people thinking about things in new ways. Um, and music is a really great methodology for that because music is one of those things that, you know, for, for MTF, the, the thing that I do now professionally, like we bring together artists and scientists and engineers and, you know, computer programmers and, you know, uh, you know all sorts of people from all sorts of backgrounds. Every, music is the point of intersection for everybody. I, I, there are very few people who just don't like music. Like if we did this as an art event, they might go, yeah, it's not really my thing. You know, I'm an engineering guy or I'm a, you know, this, that and the other thing. Almost anything else is going to exclude people. But music is one thing that people seem to agree on. You know, even if they don't agree on which music, they agree that music is a thing that, you know, is, is a good thing. So, um, so I went to the second Music Tech Fest. Uh, which was in London in 2013. That held it once in 2012. And I went to present about some of my work in, you know, it's, you know, it's not just tech, but it's also innovation in other ways. Here is this project I'm doing in Brazil at the moment. These are these things that I've done in India. This is what I did in Venezuela, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, I should actually put a mention here for uh, an organization called Unconvention. Um, so part of a lot of the things I've done with New Music Strategies and um, with uh, the university is I got involved uh, with some people in Manchester and Salford who were setting up something called Unconvention, which was basically the record industry has conferences, but we can't afford to go to them. You know, you, you basically have to have an expense account and, uh, you know, drive a Jaguar in order to be able to go to these music industry conferences. 
And most of our friends who work in music, that's not them. So we're going to have our own thing. We're going to have it in the church hall. We're going to help each other out. We're going to have these conversations. So Unconvention has been running since God knows when. Um, it's certainly... Let me think. I'd say about 15 years. Um, but uh, And they've done over 100 events around the world now. Um, so... MTF is kind of like youthful in comparison. But, um, but those connections that I made and all these fantastic projects are all through Unconvention. And uh, Jeff Thompson, who now runs it, who was there at the beginning, uh, got so much time for him. If you have any connection with Unconvention, you can consider yourself very lucky. I think it's a really great organization. I think they do really cool stuff. Um, but I went to Music Tech Fest uh, and I went as the guy from the university who was doing these interesting things. And I was kind of frustrated with the university at the time because British academia being what it is. Um, but I, I kind of pretty much immediately realized that I can do all of the things that I'm interested in within the context of Music Tech Fest that I wanted to do ever at the university. And so I basically went to Music Tech Fest and never went home. Um, and... We ha I'm now the director of MTF. Uh, I am, full disclosure, married to the founder of MTF. Um, and uh, we have now done, I think it's 22 events around the world, from New Zealand to Boston to, um, we've done three here. But Music Tech Fest changed over the years. So originally it was basically what it said on the tin. It was music, tech, and the fest from festival. And it was a three-day event where people who just did really interesting things, we brought them together, and they did really interesting things together. Uh, and it was that sort of cross-pollination of you know, brilliant minds who shared this interest in music and technology. And some of them were not musicians, and some of them were not technologists, but there was that kind of intersection. It was that sort of, when you cross the streams, you get really interesting stuff. And so most of the things that got showcased at, at uh, Music Tech Fest began at Music Tech Fest. They were things that were invented in the next room. They were things that, you know, we had a hackathon and people would make things and then get up on the stage and perform with them. And, and that was kind of, for me, that was the really cool thing about it. Um, but it was because my interest as a, as a researcher was, was practice-based research rather than sort of traditional, you know, um, asking people questions and then writing down what they said and then trying to sort of extract something from that and going to the library and copying out things. I like to do things and make things and then see what happens. Um, and again, MTF was a really fantastic way of doing that. But um, as it went along, it changed. So um, the first thing I kind of brought to it was, let's take it places that aren't London. Um, the second thing that I introduced to it was let's do an academic symposium so that I can at least legitimize the fact that I'm you know, an academic in this circle. But to actually get the academics into this room and go, what does it mean that this just happened? Um, so the first of those was at uh, Microsoft, Microsoft Research in Cambridge MA. Um, and uh, Nancy Baim and Jonathan Stern, who are phenomenal academics uh, from the US, organized what they called the after party. Uh, which is kind of a joke name because it was basically 25 academics in a room, you know, stroking their beards and, and, and talking about what had happened in the previous three days of Music Tech Fest. Um, but it became the sort of the model for, um, for what we did for quite a while afterwards, which was um, we didn't just think about and, you know, sort of write about MTF. We actually wrote a manifesto. Um, and I should have actually linked to the manifesto, but... If you if you Google Music Tech Fest manifesto or, or you know look at music uh, mtflabs.net slash manifesto, it came out of this and it was this idea that we are all music technologists and um, there are a lot of things that are problematic in the world around music and technology and we should think about them in particular ways. Some of them are about sustainability. Some of them are about inclusion. Some of them are about you know. Um, repurposable technologies, closed technologies, you know, all those sorts of things. So this manifesto was basically, became the founding document of what MTF 
went on to be. And it's still, I mean, it was written in 2014. It is still very relevant today. We might return to it later today uh, if I run out of things to talk about. Um, but also, we started to ask questions about hackathons. Um, has anybody been to a hackathon before? Okay, do you know what it is? Okay, all right, some shaking, some, some nodding. A hackathon is basically, you get some smart people in a room, you give them a challenge, you give them some technologies, you say, you've got 24 hours to come up with the best whatever it is of this. So the first thing that means, that's a competition. The second thing that means is it's based on the idea that people do their best work when they're sleep deprived. Um, it's also uh, quite often, and particularly with corporate hackathons, uh, a way of harvesting free intellectual property from innovators. Um, we have been asked to run hackathons for large corporations before. We've just turned them down flatly as soon as we found out what their IP rules were. Because it was basically, you come, you invent this thing, you leave, it's ours. Right? And this is like, I'm, I'm happily named names, Volkswagen. Um, wanted us to come in and do a thing in, in uh, Poland. Um, and uh, we just said, you know, I'm sorry, under these terms, there is no way in hell we're getting involved with that because I could not show my face again for the innovator community if we were participating in something like this. And it's not just that. I mean, it's pretty much every hackathon you're ever going to come across that has any kind of budget or publicity or, or these sorts of things. There will be prizes... Uh, and you might, you know, I've seen hackathons with $10,000 prizes, but that's cheap for the, for the organizations running them. Um, the best example I've ever seen, though, um, is Sonos. Uh, you know, the speaker, wireless speaker brand, they did a hackathon where basically the best ideas, they would first arrange on your behalf a patent in your name and pay for the legal fees for that. And then they would go into partnership with you to develop that further. Now, to me, that's how it should be done. Uh, if you're so brilliant that you've come up with something that Sonos thinks is commercially valuable to them, the idea that they would then, because most people can't afford to get a patent, right? It's a, I mean, I've gone through this process. It's a horrible process involving lots of money to people that you do not want to give money to. Um, and... And, and it's very unsatisfying. But there are, if you're at that scale, very good reasons to have them, and, uh, and you can make a lot of money by doing it. So I think that was a really good example of it. But that's, that's such an exception. It's really rare. Um, but also, the fact that it was a competition meant that when people invent new things, with, particularly with music technology, they would then show, the, show them on the stage, and then they would congratulate each other on how clever they are, and they'd go down to the pub. And the idea would be left on the floor. Uh, of, the, of the hackathon room and forgotten about, and nobody would ever do anything else with it. So we thought, okay, so how do you take these fantastic ideas and, and inject some life into them so that can become real things in the world? That was a really important thing to us. How do you make it so that it's not competitive but collaborative? So that there isn't a winner, but we all work together to solve problems, and then we go, this is great, let's continue this collaboration, let's continue this new partnership. Um, but also, how do you get further than you can get in 24 hours? Well, you can make it longer. So we ended up doing these week-long labs, which started calling them. And, and so labs became part of Music Tech Fest. And then labs became the whole thing. And we may or may not do a Music Tech Fest, but now the organization is called MTF Labs. Uh, and that flip happened uh, around about 2018, when we did um, what was still called Music Tech Fest in Stockholm. Um, but the main part of it was the um, uh, was the was the labs. There's one step. I know this is a long story. Um, there is one step before we got to Stockholm. Um, well, there's a couple, but but part of it was a project called Music Bricks. Now, we had European funding to do this innovation project. Uh, which was about taking the latest technologies coming from the sort of the academic um, seats of learning for music technology. So places like Ercom in Paris, um, uh, the Research Institute um, uh, Fraunhofer 
uh, in Germany, uh, who are the inventors of the MP3. Um, you might know them for that. Um, this, uh, uh, God, the names are going out of my head, um, University in Barcelona with uh, the music technology group there. Um, but the idea is that they come up with new research that theoretically the university wants to exploit and bring to market and the rest of it. And we said, well, we've got this community of innovators and, and early adopters. Bring us the technologies. We'll have them experiment with them, and they can make new things. And the idea is not just that you experiment with that one technology, but you take that technology and that technology and this API and that, and what can you make that is hybrid? And people were coming up with some really, really brilliant stuff. But what we also noticed is that other industries looked at it and went, well, okay, I know that you made that with music technology stuff for music technology purposes, but actually that is the thing that we need for heavy industry, agriculture, and forestry. Like, so we can take that idea and put it in here, and that's a really phenomenally cheap interface for the thing that we were trying to solve with lots and lots of really expensive technology. And actually, can we you know, take that, put it here? Um, and also, we've got some of our own technologies. This seems to be a really good method of getting people to do things with them. Can we put that technology into this domain? Um, Philips, for instance, lighting. How do we put lighting into this and have that something that you experiment with as well? Or how can we take um, IP from, from telecommunications or, you know, as I say, from forestry or from, from banking or from, you know, those fashion? How do we put that into the mix and, and get people inventing really cool and interesting stuff? And it was at that point where MTF Labs, which had always brought in people from different domains and backgrounds, it kind of made sense of the whole thing um, because it was about um, the, the it still had music and music technology at the center of it, which was the, the sort of the social glue that I talked about before. But we could bring in pretty much anybody from pretty much anywhere who was smart from a scientific background, from a creative background, uh, from, from pretty much any background, get them to work with all sorts of new technologies together and invent new things that address grand challenges. So to the point where uh, MTF in 2022 here in Aveiro, the, um, the, the theme was ecosystem living. And it was a lot about going out into the salt flats, looking at biodiversity and all these sorts of things. And we had um, oceanographers working with um, neuroscientists, working with uh, DJs, working with um, singers and choreographers. And they were not just coming up with new solutions and new um, projects that they wanted to develop further from a scientific perspective, but a performance. And one of the things that, that's great about a performance is it isn't just sort of this you know, three-minute presentation that you get at the end of a hackathon. We did this because this, and this was our result. Ta-da! You actually get something that communicates emotionally. You get something that people can actually sort of connect with and make sense of. So this art and science connection, normally people think of this, and particularly in funded project environments, that art is the thing that comes along at the end and explains all the science. Or, you know, we're now going to do a dance about nuclear physics, you know. But actually, art and, uh, and creativity is just as rigorous uh, an investigative model as the scientific method is. It's different, absolutely, but it's another way of understanding the world. It's how human beings make sense of the world in the same way that science is a way that human beings make sense of the world. And if you've got a shared vocabulary of music, for instance, then you can have people from these different domains meaningfully work together. And that's sort of what MTF Labs has always been about. Now, I'm going to show you what some of this looks like. And I have gone completely off script. Um, but, um, but of course, there are some things that we have encountered along the way um, and, and focused on along the way. Um, I wonder if I should postpone this bit and come back to it, because I've been talking a lot, and maybe it would be nice to give you a break by showing you a video. Um, so in a place called Örebro in, uh, in Sweden, there's a university there. They have an AI lab, uh, and we did a music and AI um, 
MTF Labs there, and it was sort of shorter than we normally do, but it was um, it was it was kind of cool. There were there were a few things that we did there. Um, one of which was working with the music students, or music production students, and songwriting, and also working with the um, computer science and AI department. Now those two departments at the university have no connection with each other at all. Like they do not speak to each other. They've never been on each other's areas of the campus, but MTF was about bringing those things together. Um, and so we had a couple of things going on. One was the lab uh, where we had people experimenting with the AI and robotics technologies. And one was a thing we called the trackathon, which was like obviously a, a pun on hackathon, but it's for musicians. Uh, so we did this sort of 24 hour thing and we did give you technologies, but these technologies were a set of AI-generated samples based on um, uh, Russian folk music, vocal music. So it was AI-created uh, vocal samples that could then be used in the, in the music. Um, but we got Graham Massey from 808 State uh, to come and lead this, and he was really interested in giving them a challenge around rhythm and, um, and how they think about it. Because these are Swedish songwriters, and if you've ever watched anything of Eurovision, you know what Swedish songwriting means. Um, and so he wanted them to think more sort of, um, in more kind of imaginative ways about rhythm and about uh, and other things. So I'll show you a couple of videos uh, if we can do that. I have been asked not to show videos that might be problematic from a rights perspective. So. Uh, everything I'm going to show you, um, I'm, I'm going to literally show you, is uh, stuff that we have created ourselves. And the things that I want you to see that I do not have the rights for, I'm going to put a QR code up on the screen. You can snap it, you can watch it in your own time. Um, some of them are quite long, but um, I've got links and I've got QR codes, but uh, we'll come back to that. So let me start with this. And this will just, I believe, if I can make this work. Uh, follow link. Come on. There we go. If I click on that, that will open a new, no, it'll open here. That's useful. This goes back to my being old thing. That one? Let's do that one. Okay. I don't have a volume button on this. Oh, God, okay. Maybe I need a glamorous assistant. Hugo, would you do that for me? Because this thing is not doing anything. So we need to actually get out of full screen on this. Uh, function F to get out of full screen. There we go. Okay, so this is. This is the thing that we did in Erebro, I think this is 2019. With Music Tech Fest, we wanted to give our students and mentors a chance to engage in creative workshops and to help inspire them on how they can use their knowledge within AI in new ways. People from multidisciplinary backgrounds were brought together to create prototypes as well as to further develop earlier projects, such as the Loop Free Project, which is an award-winning accessible musical instrument that enables wireless looping in Ableton Live, which is a software and hardware for music creation and live performance, without the need for screen interactions, where AI was used to craft an intelligent interactive video system that was reactive to facial expression. In another project, the Accents in Motion team developed a dance AI where they used sensors on two dancers that together with the possibility to explore distance between them in our robot lab and live coding in their dance performance, they used that data to make the dancers create music with their movements instead of the other way around. They used AI for gesture recognition and for training WaveNet models. Okay, that was what the university made. If I then go to the second clip, this will give you a little bit more insight about it. Again, there's that, and...
I think it's amazing that AI can create sounds just from hearing a reference. It's almost like a strange lens that just changed the focus of everything. And it, it, it's, there's a weird organic quality to the music, even though it's computer generated. And that's the bizarre thing. If I could use it as a, a, an instrument or as even a collaborator or a, a band member, for sure. Why not? And we're really curious and looking forward to what's going to be happening next. Uh, artists are incredible at coping with change. And the way that we can adapt and push technology is having more and more of a place uh, in institutions. I'm working on deep learning, mainly for medical images, genomics data. Wow, okay. I'm hearing harmonies, I'm hearing guitar, drums. It's learning to synthesize not just a voice, but a whole band. Oh shit, there's something really big heading towards me. Don't stare at me. A lot of fun. Yeah. A lot of dancing, a lot of just uh, vibing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Trying to think about music in a different way and like make music in a way we don't normally do. Creativity is incentive and as a motivator for collaboration across different areas of knowledge. Uh, yeah, add, add some mystery to the whole thing, and mystery is always good in music. I, I, I slept like four in the morning yesterday. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> We will be friends forever. This is very MTF behind the scenes. Okay. Um, and the other thing I wanted to show you, hopefully you're interested in this as well, is the, the trackathon side of things. So um, uh, I'll let Graham Massey describe this. Um. I'm Graham Massey, I'm a music producer, electronic musician and uh, entrepreneur, not quite, but uh, yeah, I've just been in music forever and I'm a lifer, I will be doing music forever. Oh, it, it felt like an like exciting challenge, we didn't know exactly what we are getting ourselves into. You're <laughs> we here because we don't like to sleep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have to write a song in uh, 24 hours. Yeah, it's about like, I mean, this year it seems to be about uh, creating an engaging rhythm that causes like the listener to groove the body like in a more contemporary way. Uh, it's to create something with different kind of rhythms and uh, yeah, the rhythm, or more like the feeling of the rhythm. Like feel the rhythm and uh, engaging with the music and causing the body to move. <laughs> I'm quite concerned how um, rhythm is almost reduced to being a second class citizen in a lot of music because I'm, I'm pretty drum obsessive. I like drummers and, and their contribution to music. You know, real drummers that, that have studied the craft and taking that love of drummers into electronic music has been something that I've done for maybe 30 years. How to break down beats, how to layer up beats so that they move um, dancers in a different way. Not the straight four on the floor beat or uh, like something different, still enjoyable. Yeah, that was just an idea from the beginning that I would uh, film myself while uh, doing some movements uh, to, to nothing, like start with only movement of a body uh, and then uh, go from there and to be inspired by the movements to make the music time signature is like moving from uh, six eight, uh, three four three four to two. four four yeah. and back and forth like or at the same time so you kind of can hear and the, six eight and three four yeah kind of. so you kind of can hear the both time signature yeah. at the same time and then I think about the 
creativity side. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, we can be creative on a, another level. Include some of some of the samples from Graham Massey's library of samples and the uh, how do you say like AI generated sounds. And we began by using the AI generated uh, samples and created this melody of it, uh, and that ex that inspired us. So we created the whole track around those samples. The students just had to think about that concept of like, you know, pushing rhythm to the forefront of your composition, you know, to um, um, not just use it as a frame to hang a song on. And uh, I had no idea that students were so competent in songwriting here, you know, there's a, you know, a culture of uh, pop, and I'm not quite sure whether that's a Swedish uh, idiom, but it, it would seem to be at this college like uh, people are, have a much more rounded musical approach. Um, everything is more vocal orientated, which is something I hadn't thought of. And, but the way changing the rhythm affects songwriting is of course really important. There's not too many um, songs in the pop charts that use different time signatures. I mean, we, we work a lot with popular music and commercial music, so we're just trying to do the exact opposite of what we usually do with everything. And it, it got really experimental, but really cool. And try to make a song that's all about, like, you have, you can't sit still, you have to, like, dance with it. So it's, we made a dance track, uh, like, soft dance uh, pop, um, very spacey. Yeah, we were not doing a four on the floor, we're doing different signatures and different tempos in the same song. And it's also the song is, is, is three different, very dis distinguished parts. It's, it's still very much like a, a pop song, but more um, free and... Um, um, we like to think of it as a, a jungle, uh, kind of, environment. Like the craziness of the jungle. You got the foundation and the pop song. And then we add the craziness of the jungle and with all, like, with the weather and the animals. And everything is crazy in the jungle. Thanks. I mean, we integrated, like, the samples we got from CJ, uh, where he had um, manipulated the Russian uh, folk singing into the uh, databot. And then we used one sample of those into our project. We worked a lot with the rhythms and kind of tried to use different time measures simultaneously. Uh, so it's a very rhythmic song, and kind of movie inspired, I'd say, in the sound of it. Kind of big and epic sounding. Yeah. What's the, we have two, yeah, two. No, we have. We have three or We have three samples because uh, the one you did, yeah. the drums. Oh, and right. We have this sample, uh, and I half timed uh, a sample uh, that we got like a layer on the whole beat. It's been uh, much happiness. <laughs> we were like uh, up in the roof yesterday. Yeah. Several times, like really jumping around in the room because we were so happy when we found the sounds and. And <laughs> the rhythm, and it was so much joy in the collaboration. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, of course. It's such a, it's such a strange situation. Uh, yeah. You need to write something wonderful. But I, I think it's the best thing, like, to do. Because now we have a song. Mm. I think it's amazing that AI, AI can create sounds just from hearing, like, a reference and then create something that they know should be afterwards it's i don't i i can't like understand it i can't take it in it's cool it's interesting and i think it's uh definitely important to work with i think it's ai and everything's coming so why not use it for music as well yeah it's exciting ai is kind of 
new for all of us in music, at least. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. We, the only thing I know about AI is the thing you hear on the news, like big data and all the social me- social media and commercial stuff. Yeah. But uh, nothing in music before this. Like I, I, I hadn't heard anything about AI in music. We wanted to make a, a mix between like this uh, ancient human uh, features somehow in music and also the changes that is happening right now because there's a lot uh, of changes happening today for us like with technology and uh, with the climate and all this it's very exciting to to hear and see what what you're doing with it and mm. what it's capable of so far yeah and ai is the future it's even inevitable is that word yeah. Inevitable. Yeah. <laughs> so that was uh, four years ago, um, and which is why they said they hadn't heard much about AI and music. Um, I think everybody's now heard about AI and music. Um, there's been a lot of talk about that since. But um, uh, but one of the reasons I wanted to show you that is this idea that, um, and this is probably going to be something that we'll focus on a lot today, is that. AI and you know NFTs and blockchain and VR and you know whatever whatever other emerging technologies that you, you're going to wrestle with, they are not things that happen to you. They are things that exist in the world that have affordances that you can <coughs> use, um, and there are implications of that and there are uses of that, and I think both the positive and the negative implications of those technologies are far more about the humans that use them than they are about the technologies themselves. Um, And so we'll probably talk also a lot about people. Um, It's probably a good place to take a pause because I've still got more things to read out to you. Um, So if you want to grab a coffee, that's that's really cool. We'll do that in a second. But is there any questions so far, things that either are not clear or things you want to raise or points that I've skipped over? You might want to grab the microphone now, because I think that if there are people streaming this. Okay, okay, let's check. Hello, people. Well, uh, or basically, I would just uh, like to hear. I don't know if this is if we're here. I don't know if it's amplifying here, but I think it is going out online. Okay, we yeah, good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, before before all these videos, uh, I really liked how you said uh, that's when you're working for the uni, you start getting all these like underwhelming um, questions and you didn't want to do this. Mm -hmm. Actually, what you did want to do is the social innovations and you did all these uh, projects in different uh, areas of the world. So for me, that is like clear social innovations. And well, maybe personally for me, AI is a bit overwhelming uh, topic. So it's really interesting to hear you say all of this. But uh, as a personal uh, feeling for you? Do you feel like your the involvement with the uh, uh, MTF labs? Do you feel? Does it feel to you that this is part of a social innovation, or do do you feel like it's a branch off? Or oh, a, a thousand percent. Okay, so um, the social innovation side of things uh, through MTF and also a foundation that we've created uh, called the Industry Commons Foundation is, uh, has scaled the social innovation side of things. So uh, it is, perhaps it's at a, a slight remove from actual like, projects working with street kids uh, and that are sort of doing really good work you know, on the ground, um, but they are working at a level which enables those sorts of things. So it's not about how do I want to, like I have some ideas about how the world should be, you know, right? Um, and, and I have, you know, ideas about things that are fair and things that are not fair and things that, you know, that could help. Um, but I also have an understanding that that fits within a framework that is much larger than those things. And some of those things are 
political, some of those things are, you know, social with a capital S, you know, societal, you know, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are like these real top level, you know, no poverty, no hunger, um, you know, life on land, life under the water, you know, these, these sorts of major, major big issue things. And I don't feel like I personally, by myself, can have as much impact on any of those things than I can by surrounding myself with brilliant people, providing those as challenges and working in the domains of, you know, whatever they might be, whether it's AI or whether it's, you know, um, because I think that we think that, for instance, what you saw, that they were making pop songs, right? They were making pop songs using AI technologies and, uh, and they were using studio technologies and they were thinking about rhythm in different ways and all the rest of it. And you think, okay, so that compared to teaching kids singing, counting, clapping for numeracy, for literacy, for socialization, for you know, getting people into mainstreaming, into education and you know, those sorts of things. Those are operating at different levels, but I don't think they're tangential to each other. I think in my head, they're all part of the same project and they're just operating at different scales of things. I would like to think, in fact, no, I, I do think. Um, so what we do in MTF informs policy. Um, so we take, so, so Michaela, who is the founder of, of MTF Labs, is uh, a member of President von der Leyen's high-level roundtable for the new European Bauhaus. She's, she's an advisor to the president of the European Commission. Um, and the stuff that we do in the MTF Labs, we find out about um, how people can approach problems, how we can get communities together with brilliant scientists and brilliant artists to do stuff. A lot of the stuff that we've done in Aveira, and, and I'll show you some, some video from that, has been factored into uh, policy to the extent that it's being rolled out across all regions in Europe, or 100 re regions in Europe. Um, and, and that has an impact that you know, I mean, I'm not a big fan of the phrase trickle down because I think there's, that's kind of a nonsense economic theory. Um, but, but this idea that the way in which societies work is kind of more important um, than chipping away at little corners of it. And I think the chipping away at little corners of it is really, really useful and really important. And I don't want to devalue that in any way and I'm, I'm probably being a little bit too flippant about it. But I think where I can be helpful, at least, is in bringing together people who are not me uh, in order to work on things that are really big, grand-scale problems. Um, and, and thinking about how human beings intersect with technology creative, uh, creatively is not a sideshow to that. I think it's absolutely fundamental and central to that. I think how human beings, how human beings express themselves uh, and how they communicate, and what media they use, and um, you know the things that they make, and culture is absolutely primary in all of these conversations about how you make a better world. So um, I don't know the extent to which that answers your question, um, but hopefully it will be fleshed out a bit with some of the other things that I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to give you what is the time? It is I don't know, just after half past eleven. Um, uh, let's just take five or ten minutes and grab a coffee and, um, and you know, decompress a little bit because there's some more heavy going to do and actually the sort of the, the more academic stuff is about to hit um, but I'll try and get you through that as quickly as possible but um, thank you for being polite so far. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, right, let's grab a coffee. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, any of you if you want to make uh, any questions or add something to use this mic so we also can get it into the... Uh, oh, you do have a question? So when you were when you were showing the last video where uh, the musicians were making these tracks, yeah, I think uh, so. I am someone who's learned music and who knows how to create music with the tools, not the AI tools so far. I've mm. never used an AI tool, mm. but uh, what about the generation which is like uh, being uh, like younger younger kids? Uh, what if they uh, like you know pick up on the AI tools, but they never know where uh, that came from, you know, like uh, what I mean to say is that um, I don't know how to explain this, but you know, you know that, okay, this instrument is the guitar and this instrument is the piano and this is a sound from uh, traffic and this is a sound from uh, this is 
a sound that you sampled from somewhere. Yeah. But now you can just if you can if you could just tell a machine that uh, make a sound with this and this like something like a chat GTP. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, but you never know where. Th th what do you feel about that? Like the just the. You know, is that like a good thing or a bad thing, or it's not important to view it as a good or a bad thing? But like the later generations are not going to know like the starting point of uh, you know the like you said the evolution. Right. Okay. So I there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so the, is it a good thing or a bad thing? It, it is kind of not the question um, because there will be good things about it and there'll be bad things about it, and you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but there are a few fundamental things in there. One is, I think that more music in the world is a is a unequivocally good thing. Um, I think making it harder for people to create music is not a good outcome, right? So, and I think that people don't people aren't prevented from learning the fundamentals of, of music theory or music performance, but now there are additional tools and it changes the ratio. And there will be some people who will make music very successfully who do not know how to read music, who do not know how to, um, how to mic up a drum kit or how to, uh, you know, all those things. But they know how to use other technologies that, that I don't know how to use. And so there is this sort of, uh, so the palette has been expanded and the range of people who can meaningfully participate in music creation has expanded. And I think that feels good. Um, I think this idea that um, uh, traditions are lost um, is a real thing. Um, and I think that there, there will be people who don't learn the hard stuff because they don't need to, and there's easier stuff. Um, but actually, they're going to learn hard stuff that we didn't learn, and that will be different. And it, you know, there'll be good things about that and bad things about that, etc., etc. But the thing is, that all of the old stuff doesn't get uninvented because we've got new stuff. Um, there are people who learn how to play, you know, um, uh, djembe, right? Which is basically a log and a goat skin. Right, that's that's technology, but it's it's pretty old technology. Um, but uh, it's 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 a you know it's a musical instrument that. And in fact, I tell you the thing I really love about djembe. Pretty much anyone who picks it up can make a good noise on it, but you can become an absolute master at that musical instrument. Right, uh, to me, that's the perfect musical instrument. <coughs> the harmonica is another one. Like you can pretty much make an okay noise the first time you pick up a harmonica and blow into it. That is not true of the violin, right? Uh, the, the thing about learning the violin is you have to spend three years where everybody, including you, hates you for making those noises, <laughs> right? And it, uh, there's such a steep learning curve to get to anything that's good. So I think that anything that allows people to make satisfactory music from the beginning, I think is a really cool thing. But I think with all of these things, you can become an absolute maestro at it. And I think that's probably going to be true of AI as much as it's true of a violin. Um, so all technologies are things that you can go super deep on and get super good at. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't mourn the loss of any particular traditional skill sets because cause the other thing that we've got really, really good at is valuing those traditional skill sets um, and, and you know highlighting them and incorporating them in things. There are, there are some... I can't, there's lots of really good examples of this, but um, like contemporary popular music and, and you know rock music and uh, electronic music that uses uh, traditional sounds and artists from you know um, uh, in rural India or you know tabla players you know massive attack using t using uh, Talvin Singh on, on tabla. Okay, so that that you look at that and go, that is really cool. Talvin Singh is an absolute legend and an incredible player. Um, at something that has been around for a very, very long time. And it absolutely works in that context. And not everybody in Massive Attack knows how to play tabla, or has spent those, but are good at other things and can make those things work together. And I think that actually, and I'll come to this a bit straight after the coffee, but I think that one of the things that these 
you know, I, I think about a technological environment. I don't think about specific, uh, specific technologies. And one of the things that this expanding environment enables is for us to go, I'm going to use that, but I'm also going to use that and that. And I think those things could be really cool together. So uh, that's sort of how I think about that question. But yes, you're right, it's good. And yes, you're right, it's bad. And yes, you're right, it's, it's complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Let's, I, I need a coffee. <laughs> If you're still with us online, well done. <laughs> um, so I've put up a QR code here, uh, which I'll just scroll so it shows the whole thing, um, which entirely up to you. But uh, I wrote an essay about nine years ago um, to try and put how I think about the sort of the broader context of this into words in a way that was useful. Um, and I'm going to read a bit of it to you um, because I know it's very polite of you to scan the QR code, but you're not going to read it. Um, <laughs> so, but I'm going to read you the beginning of it um, just so you get a sense of, of where it's at. But hopefully this will frame the conversation that we're going to have for, for most of the rest of the day. Um, it's called Toward a Sixth Media Age, um, and uh, hopefully this will explain what I mean by that. So, um, the intro. Over my years as an academic, I've developed several pillars of my research. These are ideas that I return to time and again as a leaping off point for understanding other things. I thought it was time that I put some of them in a form that I can point to as a shorthand so that I don't have to rehash old territory over and over again. That didn't work out, but here we are. Uh, thankfully, we live in the digital age, and I can just publish my ideas. Um, and sorry, it jumped, uh, and be done with it. So this is an article that I've written in a number of different ways over the years. The idea of five media ages has appeared in a couple of my blog posts, and it also forms part of the setup of my book, Radio in the Digital Age. But I've never been quite satisfied with the way in which the idea is stated and it's never managed to be something standalone that I can refer to in other work or point people to or bring out to discuss. So I wanted to have it in a form that's easily readable and shareable, not too bogged down in academic language, but more thoughtful and scholarly at the same time. I think it's an important idea, as ideas go, and I think it helps make sense of a lot of things. I use it to make sense of the media and music industries, but you may find it a helpful tool to apply to other areas of endeavor. <laughs> There are key phenomena that mark out the era in which we live. These are times in which government bodies of foreign nations can intercept and examine every piece of communication we exchange, in which we can go grocery shopping in the middle of the night without leaving the house in the name of convenience, in which we can quantify every aspect of our day-to-day -day activities through the use of a wearable device, in which we can speak face-to-face -face with relatives on the other side of the world as a matter of course. And of course, I was writing this nine years ago, so this was still relatively new stuff then. Um, in which we can navigate to places we have never been with the aid of a speaking device that already knows the way, and in which 10 million private homes around the world have their floors cleaned by a robot, in which national revolution is plotted and organized within a context provided free of charge by a global commercial corporation supported by advertising, in which the vast majority of what we read, watch, hear, write, say, and do takes place in a computer-mediated environment. Very few people would dispute the notion that we live in a digital age. It's almost a redundant statement, something taken for granted when speaking about anything at all that takes place here in the 21st century. Of course, it's the digital age. I mean, look how digital. But the phrase needs a little unpacking. We don't simply use a lot of digital things. We live in a digital age. That is, we inhabit digitalness. This is a period in history. There have been others. If this is the digital one, then what were the others? And is there a pattern emerging between them? What can we learn about ourselves, about culture, or even about the future by periodizing history? How long will the digital age last, and what comes after it? Um, I would argue that actually we have left the digital age, and we are now in whatever the new one is, but we'll come to that. And that's towards a sixth 
media age is what this essay is called. Um, every individual part of our society and culture is a complex and discursive practice situated within a political, geographical, and cultural framework. If we eat food, exchange gifts, listen to music, express ourselves, fall in love, try to succeed, or experience grief, we do that within a cultural, technological, and societally normative framework. This is how it's done here. This is how we do things now. And while we all differ, the parameters within which we differ are often very narrow. The interesting thing is not how different everybody is, but how similar, and how that similarity is situated within a place, a time, and a socio-political context. I am not very much like my neighbors, but I am more like them than I am like someone who lived in the 1800s or someone living in North Korea. Um, as Raymond Williams said, culture is ordinary, but it can only be ordinary within the framework of what surrounds it. It's ordinary in that we all participate in it, our culture essentially being everything we say, make, and do, but also in the sense that we have a shared understanding of the parameters of that framework and a shared set of tools through which we enact that culture. So everything we say, make, and do is cultural, and, ev and our culture is the aggregate of that everything. But what defines our culture is the context, the medium within which we are working. Now, people often think of media as the thing that connects us, just like a mediator stands between two people who disagree and, and it communicates from one to the other. We tend to consider media as a line drawn between the sender and the recipient. Uh, I write the email, you receive the email. The medium is the internet. My computer, being a MacBook, makes a whoosh sound when I hit the send key, and off it goes. The internet is the bit between you and me. But that isn't actually how it works. Uh, Marshall McLuhan said that media are environments. We don't use media, we inhabit them. The, the internet is a medium for you and me in the same way that soup is a medium for vegetables and dumplings. Email is not a line between us, but a circle around us. The extent to which we use, the, uh, sorry, the extent to which the media that we use impact upon neural plasticity, sorry, plasticity, how our brains physically change in response to our environment, is something of a contentious matter. Arguably, video games don't make us violent any more than pop concerts make us musical. But the important thing is not the sort of technologically deterministic change in response to an external stimulus, um, but the fact that we are, to a large extent, products of our broader environment. It matters very little that the dumpling repeatedly comes into contact with a piece of carrot. However, both the dumpling and the carrot always take on the flavor of the soup. The communication that we send and receive in the digital age is just as complex and multifaceted as it was in the pre-digital era, but it differs mostly in that it's contextualized within a technological environment characterized by digital media forms and communications media. It has different affordances for communication, meaning, expression, and access. And by affordances of an environment, I mean the ways in which certain opportunities are available for an actor within that space. This is gonna be really important today, so I'll, I'll underline this. So one affordance of a room with a table in it is tabletop dancing, right? The table doesn't make you dance, and nor does the room. There may even be a sign up somewhere that says, please do not dance on the table. But without that table, no tabletop dancing, right? So as an environment, Digital media have certain characteristics and affordances, and it seems to me that most of the problems that people have in terms of adapting to that environment have to do with misunderstanding or refusing to make use of those affordances. Or worse, insisting to be allowed to engage in tabletop dancing in a room where there are no longer any tables. So the essay goes on, um, but, but this, this one thing that I wanted to get to is that when we're talking about the rise of the metaverse or the musical metaverse or, or AI technologies or VR or blockchain or these things, first of all, these are not things that we use. They are things that we inhabit. They're part of our environment. They're part of how we see the world, how we hear the world, how we experience the world, how we communicate within the world. And the second thing is those things have affordances. Now, Musicians and, and particularly music technologists are really great people to talk about affordances because particularly studio musicians, because you think about most of the best records in history 
Um, and the ones that are held up as these sort of great, you know, works of art, you know, Sergeant Pepper's, you know, um, Pet Sounds, um, OK Computer, um, you know, the, these sorts of seminal albums are the albums where people went, what else can this technology do? Where are the edges of what we can push this towards? What, what are functionally the affordances of these technologies? And I think that the really interesting things that people are starting to dabble with AI, people are starting to dabble with the creative, you know, possibilities of virtual reality or, or you know, metaverse, Web3, whatever you want to call these things. But once people get to really understand them and go deep on them and go, what else can this do? Um, that's where you start to get really great stuff. And this is why I think what we do at MTF Labs is really interesting, um, because that's the whole ethos of MTF Labs. What happens if we take this to bits? The, the thing I love about the hackathon, well, not methodology, but the, the idea behind it is it's transgressive, right? Not about you know, hacking being breaking the law, but about what else can this thing do that it isn't meant to do? You know, what happens if I open it up and rewire it or change it or use it in a different way? What happens if I use it for something that it wasn't designed for? And then you start to get some really, really interesting answers. And I'd far rather you went away from this workshop going, yeah, but what else can I do? Rather than, you know, what are the instructions and how do I use it? Um, I think that's, that's kind of where the interesting stuff really hits. Um, so there's that. Um, I do want to show you another video now, which is, and this is kind of um, the other important thing, is the MTF Labs kind of has a slogan now, which is that we don't predict the future, we invent it. Um, and like, there is more than enough work to do dealing with uh, the, the current technological environment. Most people don't see, you know, it's like it's that, that whole thing about, I don't know who discovered water, but it certainly wasn't a fish. Um, because you don't see it when you're in it. We are absolutely surrounded by AI. You use AI every day, every single one of you. Even if you think that you're not using it as a tool in your work or the rest of it, you are absolutely using AI all the time um, and you're inhabiting that environment. Um, there was a point that I wanted to get to. Oh, yeah, this, this thing about um, we don't predict the future. Um, I. I got called a futurist once because I talked about new technologies and, and those sorts of things. And I, I, I've made it really clear that I am absolutely not a futurist. And I've spent a lot of time with people who are futurists. I did a, a series, I used to go and do public speaking quite a lot, particularly when I was working as a professor. Um, and I got invited to speak at this thing, um, it was a double header keynote speech in Dublin uh, with somebody who described themselves as a futurist, and particularly a music futurist. And uh, this was to the Irish Society of Composers and particularly contemporary classical musicians. Um, and uh, there were basically it was two keynote speeches. And this first guy did a speech called The Future of Music. Um, and uh, he predicted that within a year, Spotify will not exist anymore. Uh, within six to 12 months, the majority of online payments and particularly for music, we'll be, use, uh, we'll be using Facebook's own currency. Um, uh, within three years, we will all be listening to algorithmically generated music trained on our favorite composers and adapted to what we're doing. So the music would change if we were running or if we were doing housework or you know, these sorts of things. Um, and when I say this was a, you know, a thing I did recently, this was 2012 um, when these predictions were made. Um, and, and my speech, and so this, I, I will name. Uh, this guy was a guy called Gerd Leonard, who um, probably not a name you've encountered, um, and now calls himself a media futurist, I believe. Um, but uh, so he did his, you know, um, the future of music, and I did a, a speech after it called "Why Gerd Leonard is Wrong About Everything." Um, and and my point, and I, I basically I took a bet with him on the Spotify thing, and I had no idea how Spotify were doing or whether they were going to do well or all the rest of it. And he'd worked with like the founders of Spotify and he'd worked at Spotify, you know, working with them on strategy and the rest of it. And he had predicted that they would be gone within a year. Um, and I took a bet with him on that. Uh, not because I knew any better than him, but I knew that predicting the future made him wrong. Because that is just how it works. You know, you, it's almost a guarantee. If you are ever right about it, 
uh, is pure accident. But, but the most common thing that happens is something that you could not have possibly predicted. There is never a, well, last year we did this, this year we do that, so next year we're going to do this. So like, so last year we did that, this year we did that, so next year we're over here because we didn't see this thing happen. So I can't tell you anything about the future. I can only tell you what we're dealing with right now. Um, uh, da -da -da -da. Okay. Right. So I'm going to show you one video, and then I'm going to get you to do something. Uh, this is um, the MTF, and it's kind of almost most recent incarnation. This is the one that we did in October here in Aveiro last year. feels like a part of me is coming home when I get to Vero, when I step into the streets, when I venture into the salinas and the wetlands. And all this is coupled with the confidence that I will meet great minds again, whether I previously known them or not. And this confidence to be dazzled for sure. MTF 2022 around ecosystem living was an amazing collective reigning, thinking and prototyping new ways to have positive impact. I think it's ironic that somehow MTF this year was an ecosystem, a technological ecosystem by itself with great minds. The whole experience uh, took me out of my comfort zone and allowed me to try different creative approaches to creating art. Tight deadlines, new people, one purpose, loved it all. What was particularly interesting was seeing the process throughout the week, going from first initial ideas and sparks all the way to the final performance. Especially what was amazing to witness was people coming together and through collective effort really making the performance in something truly unique. For me, MTF is about getting inspired together and going for creative adventures. It's sand between the toes and salt on metal sheets. A jam session in the theater as the sun is setting. This year's Music Tech Fest in Aveiro was particularly special, in part due to the theme, but also due to the diverse mix of people who had gathered there to collaborate and experiment. Yeah, a fantastic year to take part in it, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. MTF is an opportunity to explore our minds, a place of creative and sustainable search with people from all kinds of cultures and areas of expertise which make me grow as a human being and as a professional. MTF Labs 22 in Aviero was for me all the best parts of a conference. Uh, a place where the networking was replaced by an ecosystem of relationships. Um, while imposter syndrome was real, uh, it was shared and while it was terrifying and challenging to be surrounded by so many incredibly highly impressive people, um, we made some awesome things happen. It was really great to be a part of. And each day, each hour, and each conversation I had was a new experience, was something new I could learn. And what was great is that we grew together as the week passed. We grew in confidence, we grew in the ability to discuss certain ideas. Some things paid off, some things didn't. But to have that open conversation in a, in a comfortable environment was something that was very unique. And to have the time to think creatively and co-create with other people 
something that was just really special. For me, MTF Labs was an opportunity to feel reconnected to my field of interest and passion by learning from others. I love the fact that there were people from different backgrounds and age groups, which is not so easy to have in my work circles now. The MTF uh, was an opportunity to experiment with other people, which in another context would be very unlikely to work with. But it was great, I learned a lot and it was really funny. I loved attending the MTF because I had the opportunity to meet a very diverse group of people that I wouldn't have been able to meet otherwise. This experience was an opening of the mind to new possibilities. It was love, it was union, it was meeting incredible people. Two words to describe empty of this year, exciting and inspiring. This was really special to me because it made it feel like I'm able to contribute to some of the solutions that we all need to improve the world that we've created and um, save it. It's something that Monica said. There is no such thing as waste in an ecosystem. I think that's profound. It was so special to return to Aveiro this year for the second year in a row um, and to experience the Costa Nova again this time very foggy and to be in the water as a community um, in the muddy soil in the marshes and most of all to be with the humans that make up the ecosystem of MTF Labs um, it's a particular ecosystem these humans are not contained by MTF and they come together uh, as a community in some cross-pollination ritual that's very special. I should have let the credits run through that, but I'm not going to. Um, I want you to connect what you just saw there with what I was just reading out of the essay thing, this idea that all of these technologies are not external to us. They are not things that happen to us. They are not you know, um, external forces that we need to cope with or use. They're, they're human beings communicating with each other. Um, and, and that's all they are. And, and we could probably end there uh, with that takeaway, because I think that that's, you know, uh, the, the then how do I use this particular piece of technology or, you know, how should I apply this or, you know, what other tools should I use in order to achieve X, Y, Z? Those are kind of the how to, and I'm far more interested in the why um, and what is it you're trying to achieve. So, what do I, what I want to do actually, um, and I'm going to split you into, normally I'd split you into groups of three or four, but I think we're a small group. Um, so, hang on, can we do three? One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, we can. Okay, so let's do three groups of three. And I want you just to spend the next five minutes figuring out why you're here. How will you know that today has been a good day? That, that, that this has been successful for you? What are the things that you want to come away with that, because otherwise I won't know, and so hopefully I'll be able to address some of these. But I want you to like collectively agree together what you think a good outcome would be and what you want to come away with. So because people tend to gravitate towards where they're sitting for a particular reason, I'm gonna, in this three groups of three, I'm gonna say group one, group two, group three, group one, group two, group three, group one, group two, group three, okay? 
So you'll have to stand up and move around, is what I'm saying. Um, so let's have group one over here, group two over there, and group three over here, and just spend a little bit of time figuring out. Yeah, just I mean, somebody can write things down if uh, if that's useful. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll spend yeah five minutes or so figuring that out. Uh, with your permission, is uh, actually get you to present the thing that you think that uh, you would like to get out of this and why you'd like to get out of it and you know where you're coming from with that. And I will record it, if that's cool. Uh, just audio. Um, and uh, we'll start with group, uh, with your permission. Is that, yeah, yeah, yeah. cool, cool, cool. I'm having nodding heads. All right, so. Um, so. <coughs> So I'm recording. This is group three we're going to start with. And uh, there is their microphone so that they can be heard on the internet. But uh, yes, okay. you have oh, the, you have you're the, the spokesperson. Let me put this yeah. closer to you then. Okay, so I, uh, I actually just made notes of uh, what each of us was uh, saying. Uh, and Fatma said that uh, her reasons were to reconnect with uh, being creative again and uh, learn new things um, to bring people together. And you said social, uh, you also said uh, something. Social, social, social. <laughs> improve the social skills. Ah, improve yeah. the social skills, yeah. Social. Yeah, and uh, uh, Rita said um, uh, to reconnect to creativity again. I think this was something, reconnecting to creativity again is something three thought uh, about and uh, we also I think Rita made us notice that uh, it's I think it makes sense that this program is called break <laughs> break in case of emergency because uh, so this is something that I also uh, feel that I've been I've been a music producer I've been working as a music producer for the last eight to ten years but I uh, I feel things are getting less exciting for me back home and uh, I want to do more things that kind of bring me back to where, w uh, you know, the exciting bits and like reconnect with. So I think that's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's why I think the break, the name break is also very important. Like break what you're doing and maybe like, you know, zone out of it and look at it with a new perspective. So I think, yeah, that's why. That's cool. Uh, but I love the part where you said. Uh, Mike. Mike. Uh, I just want to say, I love the part where you said that uh, you had this medium always somewhere there. Or maybe uh, I really love this part. You know? What do you mean? Like you were saying that. Uh, ah, yes. You know? I can say it. I love that. Yes, because I, am, I actually come from uh, the visuals um, area. Uh, I studied fine art. But I always explored sound, and I actually made some projects with children in sound, uh, which I made some installations in sound compositions. But I was always uh, afraid because I'm not a musician. I cannot do this, uh, so I have to stop this. 
I would be very intimidated if I would see a machine and if I would touch it, I would be so happy and this was always a confusion <laughs> to me. And now I'm in a, cer a certain age and state of life which I don't have nothing to do and I want to be happy and make people happy and that's why I'm here. Can I ask you just to go a little bit more focused on today? How will you know if today has been successful? The break thing, I can totally get where you're coming from. I have a kind of a, an agenda where I need to get you uh, engaging with this idea of new technologies and emerging technologies, and how will you know when that's been successful? Well, for me, for sure, it's... Uh uh, being intimidated, but going anyway for it. And I think this is, uh, already this session so far has helped me take more baby steps towards it. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, for cool. Me, for sure. Do you want to say yeah, I think, uh, I think I have my biases when it comes to the new technologies and I want to not have those biases. I want to uh, like look at it from a open perspective. Right. So I think this is gonna. I, I want this to help me be able to do that. Uh, like even AI or like what we were talking about. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> just an open perspective. Well, I can tell you we're going to be talking about some scary stuff, yeah. and we're also going to be talking about some some exciting stuff. I think. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's really cool that, that it is about creativity for you, it's about connecting with people, it's about the social side of it, uh, and it's about, um, uh, I, I guess, feeling like you have some kind of agency in the face of all this new stuff that, that is happening, that, that, you know, there might, it might be tiny steps, but it, it's, you know, steps that you might not otherwise have thought to take or all those sorts of things. So I, I hope... Yeah, I, on all of those levels, I hope you'll come away from today feeling a little bit empowered to actually just get in deep and grapple with it. You are not going to come out of here, just in case anybody's already written this down, uh, knowing how to use all of the technologies and what to use them for and you know how they work and how to program them and all the rest of it. That's not what we're doing today, but that's, that's really cool. That's encouraging. So I'm going to stop that recording. Thank you, group one. Three. Three, Three. sorry. <laughs> right, so we'll go to group one then. Because you're also close. Okay. Three, one, two. Three, one, two. So this is group one now. Okay. So I think what we we've, what we've came up with and uh, that we share uh, between the three of us, um, I think one of them is finding uh, what we believe to be healthy balance uh, in the usage of technologies. Um, me personally, I started using uh, smartphone less than a year ago and uh, I have <laughs> I work with a lot I work with synthesizers and uh, with computers of course and real stuff but uh, I also have um, sometimes also um, it's hard for me sometimes to embrace new technologies and also I think also because uh, I don't understand it I'm a, I'm a bit like Fatma like uh, I think is there's so much information and uh, so much stuff going on all the time that it's difficult first it's difficult to have criteria to choose what you want to engage with and what you don't want to engage with because I don't think most people have enough technological lit literacy to, to actually decide what they want to engage with or not. And um, yeah, and, and also uh, what we also talked about before that any technology can be used in a variety of ways that can be better or worse. Uh, and um, yeah, just kind of have a general idea of um, which technologies you can use, how you can use them uh, for better, and also in a way that gets you more connected, not in the digital sense, or in the, but uh, more connected in the human sense, and uh, less disconnected. Because I think through technology, uh, it's possible to go both ways, no? to get more connected uh, at a human level or more disconnected and uh, I think that's also one of the reasons why maybe I think also all the three of us are a bit sometimes afraid of technology or uh, or resistant to new technologies because uh, we want also to find the right way of doing it for us that works for us. And mm. 
Yeah, and I also don't, uh, I'm a bit afraid to, or I don't want technology to dictate what I do. I want to embrace it, but I want to be connected with my feelings, keep connected with that, and have that conscience that I'm still connected with myself, and that it's not technology that it's leading what I'm doing. That's my main concern. Um, yeah. Cool. <coughs> we also talked about connecting with people. I think nowadays it's more and more important in finding the lines in uh, it's Facebook connecting, it's Instagram connecting, or is this connecting? W what is? Let's let's find it out because uh, I think there are still politics to to be made <laughs> around this. And for me uh, personally. Uh, I uh, I also have uh, I I want to 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 understand better what techno technologies I want for myself and what I don't and I want to understand what makes the the human being special or characteristic and uh, try to go uh, try to follow that path and leave other things to technology and things that maybe AI will be always better than me making math or making, uh, I don't know, uh, mathematics. <laughs> so leave it, <laughs> Le leave it to you. I'm not, I will not want to compete with you uh, on that. And, but maybe it's much more easier for me to, to, to understand if someone is, happy or sad just by looking at them and AI for sure AI s will do that uh, someday very easily but I think we it's we they have comp competition on that still with humans <laughs> <laughs> sure okay so f from what I'm hearing it's about again it's it's a bit about agency it's a bit about feeling like that you have some control uh, and not that you are being controlled um, by the technologies. Um, I think that's a really good reason to understand them. Um, and I think that a lot of fear comes from not understanding them. And I don't mean, again, knowing how to program them or knowing how to build them or knowing how, but just knowing what they are and what they do and what they don't do and, and those sorts of things can be really helpful. Um, and also um, separating the reality from the discourse is really important. Like, there is always going to be um, a lot of uh, fear in media because that's what sells newspapers. That's what you know gets clicks. That's what you know. Um, and and there's a lot of stuff that is scary. Um, that is genuinely scary about a lot of technologies. Um, in the same way, there's a lot of stuff that's genuinely scary about television. It's genuinely scary about radio. Genuinely scary about the printed word, um, and, and so like you can you can extrapolate these, and this has always been true all over time. But the people who have uh, people have used these things to gain and exert power for a very long time. Um, I mean, like you think of this sort of the classic technology of of uh, of handwriting, like of, of the written word instead of the spoken word. That's that's a that was a phenomenal technological shift that suddenly you could capture ideas and then there was this thing called the text and you could no longer question the person telling the story because it is written, right? And then people used that to instill power relationships because the one with the literacy could stand up the front and tell people, it is written, the word is, you know, et cetera. Um, and, and so th this has never not been true, but the thing that started to unpack that was literacy, right? People actually, you know, being able to read and write uh, made, you know, it sort of it, it uh, diffused some of that sort of that power relationship, and then people used print in a different way, and then people used, you know, uh, electronic media in a different way, and now digital media, and then you know, uh, and then more. Um, I, I've got more to say on that, but I think that's a that's a really interesting thing. Is, you know, I need to get my hands on these things so that I can diffuse the power that it can have over me, and actually, you know integrate it into to things that I want to use. I mean, yeah. Um, but also, some of these things are useful. And, uh, you know, it could, I, I'm quite a lazy person. 
uh, in a lot of ways. Um, but that makes me work hard at getting better at finding the things that save me effort. So, um, But I think that th those are really good things to, to want out of this. So thank you very much, group one. Now stop that recording, start the next one. This is group, sorry, this is group two. Hello. Um, so um, thank you all for, for being here also. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit just about my my pad, I, th I guess, um, because I think we, uh, we three have some kind of, uh, you know, just uh, info will. We want to have more information. That was like the main thing that I guess connected us and the sense of community. Um, but for me, it's, it's kind of, um, I think I'm a very receptive person and um, I just want to feel inspired about anything that I can get from here. It's like uh, it can come from the speakers or it can come from whoever is here. Um, and <coughs> I'm just trying to position myself in accordance to what everything or everyone else is doing and finding my way. I guess it could be a different event. I guess the 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 name of the event when I talked to with Ugu about this, it's completely uh, logical for me at the moment of my life because I was exploring a different area, more science oriented. And before that, I always been a musician. And um, so I just figured that I wanted to reconnect with that part of me being a musician, but also having um, a clearer uh, thought about what it is technology and, and what the world is today in a more broader way and I haven't been searching for that so I guess this event for me is completely at the right time so and meeting different people connecting with community sharing ideas and feel inspired that's all I'm doing here get my way going. That's, that's it. So I think I, hi, I'm Sam, by the way. Hi. I think the greatest thing that's happened here today is that I'm skipping work and I'm not making cables. <laughs> 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 it is true, he knows, he works with me. <laughs> no, it's not that. Oh, but that's too. <laughs> and I am just coming here to acquire future that we live in now. We live in the future in the light now. I love to think that way now. Hmm. And yeah, here's what we have. Make network, meet new people. Kind of, yeah. You had a relationship with, uh, with an AI. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, I had that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really like, like technology in general. Yeah, so I'm here for that. Cool. Yeah. Was it private? <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the thing that is we, we try to find like the the common thing that we we found together, it, I think it was the networking. Yeah. Because I don't know, I first started to study AI systems 25 years ago, and I started to work with uh, computer networks more than 30 years ago, so none of these technologies is, is new to me, so, so I think it's mainly the networking, and, and I think that's that's uh, the three of us. Yeah. It's the thing. So I think that's it. That's cool. That's, uh, I mean, that's, that's a really easy outcome to achieve then because you're sitting in a room with other people yeah. who are interested yeah. in some of the th <laughs> same things as you. So that, that sort of networking and, and making connections with other human beings, I, I think is a, you know, that's a really great outcome to set as a, as a you know, desirable result for today because you're going into there with pretty much a guarantee of success, so, <laughs> which is very cool. Let me grab my, uh, my phone back. I am going to do another round with the phone, but for everyone. Um, 
but I also want to talk about why I'm here and what I want to get out of this. Um, and I'll record that as well, because why not? Um, and, and to me, I think it is very much this, this uh, human intersection with technology. The, the most conversations that people have about technology, they forget the human part of it. And uh, like I think of as technologies as extensions of human beings. Um, like uh, television helps us see further, and radio helps us hear further, and um, there's a great Steve Jobs line about computers being bicycles for the mind. I, re I love that idea of, of the, you know, because I, I like bicycles, um, but also because I think this idea of it being like almost like a prosthetic of ourselves that helps us engage with the world that enables us to do things that we couldn't otherwise do. But it's not that they're separate from us, that they extend us. Um, but it does it for the purpose of all the things that you've talked about here. Like everybody has put a human spin on what you want to get out of this. You're not here to learn about technology, as far as I can tell. You're here to learn about how can I be more human given technology, you know? <laughs> Um, and, and I think that's a really amazing thing to, to be in a room with is because quite often when you have conversations about technology, people just want to know which button to press and which lever to pull. And, you know, how can I... I mean, quite often it is, you know, what tools shall I use to make more money doing the thing that I do? And so, like, the objective with you, and the, the next thing I want to talk to you about, we've got a little bit more time for that, maybe 10 minutes, um, is is about your bigger objective. You know, what is it you do? How do you know that you're doing it well? And, um, and you know, when you say, you, you know, you want to have more control over technology rather than technology controlling you, my question is, while you're doing what? And, and how will you know when you're successful? You know, uh, you know, if you're a musician, is your music successful when X number of people hear it or when you make X amount of money or when you feel creatively fulfilled or when, you know, somebody says to you, oh, your song really helped me when my father died or, you know, what, what are the, the metrics of success for the things that you do and how will you know that you're doing them well? So we'll, we'll, we'll actually, not in the groups, we'll just go around um, and I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to think about that because that's a big question. Who are you? What do you do? Why do you do it? How do you know when you'll be successful? Um, but but then you can actually start to think about these technologies in the service of that, right? It's not just what does this technology do, but I want to do this. How do I use this or which of these things should I use that will help me achieve that? And which of these things are of no help to me whatsoever and I should just ignore them? Um, you know, because that's also quite a possible thing to do. So just have a quick think for a minute about who you are, what you do, and how you know when you're doing that well. What's a good outcome for you? And then we'll go around again. I think. I mean, you can talk about it, for sure. Um, but, uh, yeah. I mean, actually, no, it's nice. We talked about wanting to connect. In your groups, talk about those things for a minute, about what you do and what you are. Thank you. 
kafir gibi böyle havlunun koyduğu bir şeyi bahsedebilirim çünkü bu kadar kısa sürede bir dünya bir şey bilirim çünkü bu şeyi yakalayın ki ben ki o kadar çok kısmını bilmiyorum ben kafir gibi havlun gibi bahsedebilirim başlıyor ama çünkü çizgimde işte bütün bütün temalı 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 Şey var, bir şey var, bir şey var, şey var, bir 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 É mais difícil, ou seja, nós, a nível, pá, não sei, um termo americano não está baseado no livro, pelo contrário, isto é um buraco, porque está a música desta forma é um buraco, mas, é pá, estou muito especioso, eu fico muito especioso, então esta, esta... Mas tu achas que é mais tentar chegar a, as pessoas já existem, só querem comprovas, ou tentar que as pessoas do futuro, ou tentar mudar mentes também, eu acredito que é mais pela experiência, pelas pessoas que estão por vir. profissional e de, 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 de tecnologia que eu acho que, que é muito complicado. Okay, let's let's just go around quickly because it shouldn't, you know, you know yourself, it shouldn't be too complicated to figure this out. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we are going to go around the room now and um, hear why people do what they do, what they're trying to achieve, how they know that they'll be successful. Um, so do you want to take A, the microphone, and B, this phone, and pass it around as we go? And we'll just go around this way. So I think uh, um, to be successful in my work is uh, when uh, I see I feel successful in my work when I see that people engage and interact with something that I do. Uh, this can be like emotionally, this can be like uh, develop, uh, devel uh, developing ideas. So this can be in different layers, but I feel successful when I feel like that this interaction is happening. And then about the use of the new technologies, I feel also that it's very interesting to connect, for example, with the AI and uh, to see what uh, ideas is and emotions uh, are giving to me um, with this uh, dialogue. And uh, I feel that uh, we would be very successful if we use it in a way that we create good things, we create good ideas, we create uh, new uh, interactions and inspirations for new worlds. So uh, we shouldn't be like afraid that we are going to create any damage to anything because if we do this, then the dialogue will be uh, very successful. So. <laughs> well, for me, maybe more personal in life right now, um, what I actually do, you're asking like, yeah, for how to use this for what we do. And right now I'm in some kind of crossroad that physically I'm not sure exactly what to do. Um, but uh, one thing, I think I've been using technology for at this point, when not knowing exactly what direction, is to gain more knowledge, just learning about new things. So that is, in a way, expansion. And I think once I, well, actually, yeah, I am, at, I am doing stuff. <laughs> um, so it's it's a lot about expanding or making making something inside of me bigger. So uh, hi, uh, I just quickly introduce myself. I'm Abhishek, uh, and I uh, I'm a music producer. 
I run a recording studio in New Delhi and I also make my own music uh, as Goya. That's my artist moniker. Uh, I think in the recent past years, I've realized that I'm, I'm probably the happiest when I'm actually in the act of creating music. Or it and creating music includes like mixing or like uh, you know just the areas, but actually being involved in that and it might be a few hours in a day or it might be a few hours in a week, but that is the time that I feel the most connected with myself and I think beyond having uh, like obviously beyond having financial stability doing what I'm doing which is sometimes a struggle, but I I want that 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 state always exists and it keeps growing that I'm connected with myself as a musician and sometimes I've, reali I've realized that that's uh, although you're talking about a connection with yourself but sometimes it's dependent on others and it's sometimes dependent on uh, collaboration <laughs> uh, with certain people with certain uh, also <coughs> artists who are uh, like similar similar passions similar ambitions so yeah, I think I want to do more things that connect me to myself uh, as a musician, which is uh, what uh, would be my definition of being successful. Cool. Yeah. Great. So um, I'm going to try and uh, synthesize as possible. Um, so my main goal through art, which is something that makes me feel alive, is um, exactly that, is trying to send out a message of uh, people, for people, to feel good emotionally and uh, feel alive. That's part of what I try to do. and. My my main main thing is try to create a project with uh, what resources I already have um, in various types of resources, which is just knowledge and uh, being able to operate with with machines, or just being able to play an instrument, or to have conceptual uh, knowledge actually have s have something to transmit to share um, which in fact connects with people and uh, makes what I do valuable and having time to do that which involves so many things to be able to have time to create art so that's that's mainly what I want to do Success. <laughs> what is that actually? <laughs> <laughs> For everyone, it's a different thing. And um, in life, I've done so many things. I have never been the best of the things that I've done, but it's been good enough for me, and I feel already uh, successful. Where I'm going to? I don't know. I'm just going with the flow. Let's see <laughs> where it's going to take. Um, I don't work uh, directly with the music industry, but somehow I, I have a platform that helps musicians and other cultural promoters to, to promote their, their events. And I have um, a quite good understanding of all these technologies because I was always an early adopter or curious about the technologies, even with the music technology, synthesizers, samplers, I had, um, I wanted to understand them, I, I had my experience creating music, and then, okay, it's enough for me, I had uh, my cup of tea, yeah. and um, so for me, my, my little success here, it would be to, to better understand how others see these technologies, how, what are their fears, their desires, or how because for me, something that I, I work with uh, 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 for a long time, or try to understand them for a long time, but for most of people, it's something that, uh, that's uh, quite new and can be a bit overwhelming. Sure. Cool. And 
pass the phone down as well. Thank you. Okay, so at the uh, personal level, as um, a as music musician, I'm quite happy with the technologies I'm using. I always keep an eye open. I research a lot. Uh, I work with a lot of um, different kinds of uh, sequencing, of uh, synthesis. Of I, I embrace, in that sense, I embrace technology in general, and I'm, I'm constantly evolving and trying out new stuff. I'm just... I'm just uh, sorry I don't have so much time as I would like to really go deep sometimes into some of these technologies. I, w I hope I will have more in the future, but, um, well, a man, a man can dream. <laughs> but, uh, um, but, but at uh, the professional level, uh, also as a label manager and very small uh, and, uh, and uh, emergent uh, independent label, uh, that is unclass we work mainly with what, what we call unclassifiable music because it's musical that we music that you actually fit uh, think doesn't fit a uh, genre and it's what interests us most is working in these fringes and i think if, if someone works with pop music or rap music or in it's, it's it's very defined it's very easy to find your audiences it's easier to find your niche and to kind of connect and i heard other two people talk about engagement and about uh, transmitting a message you know that was mostly Rita and uh, Miguel. And as label manager, and it's I think one of the most frustrating things is to, to, to watch, to witness someone uh, commit so much effort and love and time to creating uh, a body of art uh, that can be a, a track or an album or, or whatever. And then that uh, this uh, track or album cannot reach uh, the people that it's intended to or that, that, that can resonate with uh, this. And um, so I think one of the things at that level that uh, brings me here, uh, besides uh, being <laughs> organizing this, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, the, um, it's, it's to understand how also how technologies can amplify uh, this possibility of, uh, of uh, reach and of engagement, uh, not trying to convert uh, uh, people to what uh, these artists are doing, but actually trying to reach the people that actually can resonate and be interested in the creations of, uh, of these uh, musicians that in which we absolutely believe and that's why we release them. So I think at the professional level that would be like a success for, for me. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so I, I'm Rafael. Um, I'm a designer and musician. Um, so I've always been in touch with art and self-expression through all my life, and so a magic of success for me is being able to, ha to, be, to have the freedom to self-express. Um, and, um, and I'm starting to realize that I'm happier um, if I rely less on technology, especially when composing music. Mm -hmm. If I'm only me in the piano, I'm happier, and probably I compose better songs just me in the piano, yep. R without relying too much on the computer and sequencing on MIDI or whatever. So um, that's one magic of success, which is trying to make uh, to be creative with less resources. Um, and another metric is that when you receive some kind of feedback from people, from friends, saying like, "I really felt you." in your songs, I really felt your pain. It's like, when I, when I compose, I, I, I really don't care if people will like it or felt it or, or not. I do it for myself. But it's really um, interesting to see that people felt something. They might feel quite the opposite, uh, I, I meant to, but mm. they felt something. Mm. Um, so that's success for me, too. Cool, fantastic. say that for me I'm trying to understand in the world what well in the case of technology but other things too politics for example what are the things that I want to them to remain in the planet and what are the things that I would rather send them off to deep space <laughs> so uh, uh, li uh, I think and I uh, and so I feel I have to first go to the extremes 
because they are easier. Uh, technology made for torture people or animals are things that, for me, it's uh, easy no. <laughs> but uh, and uh, then going down, going down to towards the center, and and it's going to get difficult. Uh, the but searching for answers. I don't know. And on th on that way, what are the things that that has human? We are deciding that we want this. We want this to stay. Uh, cool. Fantastic. Okay. Well, that's that makes my job a little easier in a lot of ways. Um, the thing that we're going to have lunch. Um, the thing I want you to think about next is what are the things that prevent you from doing that? Because pretty much everybody has said that they want to focus on creativity, expression, emotion you know, time to get away from technology, to, you know, uh, focus on just the music. And what are the things that get in the way of that? Because if uh, we've got any possibility for, uh, you know, a use of these technologies, you know, maybe technology is not going to steal your job. Maybe it's going to take away some of the tasks um, that, that might make that easier. I want to show you something just real quick um, before we go off to lunch. Uh, let me just check to see if I've done this correctly. Um, give me a minute. Uh, okay. Uh, let me refresh this. Okay, so here's something that I do. Um, uh, let me open this. So, I don't know if you can see that. Um, uh, group three, in this audio recording, group three discusses their reasons for attending the program, break in case of emergency. Each member expresses a desire to reconnect with creativity and explore emerging technologies without biases. The group hopes to gain agency, improve social skills, and take small steps towards exploring new ideas. Now, the whole transcript is there. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but these are the main points. I mean, we can see if we agree with these. These are the main points that you discussed. Um, uh, the, the action items, uh, what you might want to do, embrace an open perspective, engage in discussions about emerging technologies, um, but also some follow-up questions that we can think about. How can we hold ourselves accountable for making progress towards our goal? What specific steps can we take towards exploring new technologies? Um, so for me, this is a really, the, the thing that I just did with the recording uh, <laughs> is one of the things that is my take away the hard work, the tasks and so on. Um, some potential arguments about, but also because I'm, you know, like I say, I'm a bit lazy. Um, we've got a blog post out of this if we want to uh, <laughs> post it, um, and uh, so it's like five paragraphs, you know. But overall, the group discussion was encouraging and empowering. We discovered that we were not alone in our desire to reconnect with creativity and explore emerging technologies, and we were able to support each other in our goals. In our increasingly fast-paced world, it can be easy to feel lost or overwhelmed by all the new technologies and possibilities, but by taking small steps and embracing, uh, sorry, I got lost, um, embracing an open perspective, we can stay motivated, stay engaged, and stay curious. Now, to me, that's, that's a reasonably good summary of what you talked about, right? Um, uh, let me um, just... Okay, so we can have that conversation about, you know, which we... But, uh, but um, actually, this one's just, just finished doing, which is the um, defining success through self-expression and technology. So we talked about what each of us considers as success and how technology plays a role in achieving that success. We discussed various aspects from connecting with AI to promoting events through technology, expanding knowledge and gaining financial stability. Didn't really talk so much about that. Um, we also shared our individual goals and how technology is instrumental in accomplishing them. For some, success involves creating music, promoting culture, or sending out a message of emotional well-being. For others, it means staying true to oneself and being creative with lesser resources. We explored the pos possibilities of technology amplifying the possibility of engagement with the audience. Again, this is something that, um, there's the full transcript of what everybody said. Um, these were the main points. Um, and success is defined differently by each speaker, but, um, you know, and we can have a blog post out of it if we want. <laughs> so <laughs> this is one of the tools that I use a lot, and you can see why for yeah. someone like me. This is really super helpful. It summarized it also. Yeah, it summarized it also, but it also so even said, even like <laughs> follow up ideas here, are some, here are some things that we now need to do, and 
some questions that we need to follow up, but also some challenges to that, you know, some potential arguments against. And I've, I've deliberately set it up in this way. Now, just to be really clear, I am not a programmer. This is not programming that I have done. This is just tools that are available to put together in a particular way that I find useful. Um, and and I have to, I've got to tell just before we have lunch, and I'm, I know I'm, you know, no, we're no, now no, quarter no. past we one. We can also start a bit later. Okay. If, uh, if everyone agrees. Yeah. So, I don't know if you remember when you asked me to do this, and I came back to you pretty quickly with a, you know, here is the, the structure of yeah. how we're going to do it. I didn't write that structure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I basically, the thing that you asked me to do, I asked this, how should we structure that? And it came back with this and you went, you know what, you should do the whole day because this is a really good structure. <laughs> and you'll notice that I haven't stuck to that structure, but I did want to point out that this is one of the ways that the, the bits of work that I find really interesting of this, you know, I, I really like really interesting groups of people having really interesting discussions. I'm not such a fan of uh, the administration that goes behind that. I am really excited for this to happen with our accounts uh, because that is one of the things that I like the least. And like, like you, I, w I mean, this is my piano, yeah. you know. Um, I would far rather spend time doing this than that. Um, and to, to, you know, the time that would take to write those up, to summarize what you said, to sort of uh, characterize it, organize it and all the rest of it. Um, like we did this while we were talking and I think that's uh, to me that's a really useful so yeah, we can talk about that but let's do it after lunch but yeah so I just wanted to uh, partly it was to show that I can yeah, do that yeah, but yeah. also <laughs> this is useful stuff and I'll share it with you yeah let me just change that one <laughs> 